Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we'll be short, starting in a short while. We're just going to wait for a couple more persons to join us, uh, and then we'll be able to start the conversation. We're really looking forward to chatting with you today and going through this topic. So we'll give persons just a few more moments to join, and then we'll begin. Just as another reminder, I'll repeat it a bit later. Um, for those of you who um, would like to benefit from the interpretation, you can just look at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There's a little globe uh, and you can tap that and choose your interpretation option um, so that you can benefit fully from today's session, yeah? Okay, so you can hear us here from Stockholm. I can't hear you now. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you, uh, Nordstrom. Okay, very good. Thank you. So this is Anders now joining as well. Good to Brilliant. see you, Pierre. Brilliant. Oh, yeah. Brilliant. Um, so I think we can begin now. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for this official N4G side event. And it's entitled From Nutrition Commitments to Action, the Importance of a Coalition for Action on Healthy Diets, uh, from Sustainable Food Systems for Children, and all in this the Decade of Action on Nutrition. And we're all passionate about this topic. Um, this event was co-organized by Care, Eat, Gain, uh, SUN, the WHO, and WWF, and all members of the Coalition of Action on Healthy Diets from Sustainable Food Systems. Um, in short, the Healthy Diets Coalition. Um, my name is Pierre Cook, and I'm your moderator for, for today. Um, I'm 21 years old, I'm a third year law student, um, president of my law society, and that's just about enough about me. I'm also a health advocate. Um, I've been engaged in conversations around childhood obesity, um, food security, um, protection of health, and the rights to health. So I too am interested and excited about today's discussion. Now, Throughout the food system summit processes, the youth contingent raised their voices on some of the issues and you know, demands and share their expertise and passion, um, calling for change and change to create sustainable food systems to deliver on those healthy foods and, and make them more accessible for us for both current and future generations. Now, today we are fostering a dialogue between our panelists who are all members of the Healthy Diets Coalition. I will be pitching questions to our panelists. And of course, we want to hear from you, the audience. So please make sure to use the question and answer se segment. Um, we have a chat box that you can drop your questions in and I'll be sure to pose them to our panelists um, as the time permits. Now, to our esteemed panelists, in our first round of questions, I will ask you to introduce yourself and just to provide some insight into you know, your background and expertise. Um, so first I'd like to in invite um, Karina Hawks, the director of the Center for Food Policy at the City of University of London. Um, Karina, the Food Systems Summit has placed some global spotlight on the interconnectedness of people and planetary health. Um, I'm gonna ask you first to introduce yourself and then we're gonna get into some questions around that topic, yes? 
Sure, yes. Um, my name is uh, Professor Corinna Hawkes, uh, Director of the Centre for Food Policy and one of the co-initiators of the Healthy Diets Coalition. Delighted to be here. Thank you very much. And I think it, it makes more sense for us to go around and introduce all the other panelists. So in no particular order, I'll invite you to just say something short about yourself and your background. Did you want us to continue? Yeah, yeah, sorry, yes. Okay, okay. So I'm uh, Dr. Lia Tadessa, I'm uh, the Minister of Health for Ethiopia. And my background, I'm a physician with OBGYN specialty and uh, healthcare administration. And I've been in different leadership roles in public health, in public institutions, as well as non-governmental organizations. And very happy to be here in this uh, uh, area, which I'm really passionate about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedeshe. Um, I think we can go on to you, Anders. You're muted. Just click that little mic. No, it should yeah. be okay. I'm actually going to yeah. switch computer in a few minutes to my normal <laughs> computer, but I was in a meeting, but Brilliant. delighted to be with you. Um, uh, my name is Anders Nordstrom. I'm the Swedish ambassador for global health. And by global health, we really mean health cutting across. It's not just about the virus that we are fighting right now, but enabling people to stay and to live long and healthy lives. Uh, so the food issues here, and especially the nexus in between food and climate, is of great interest then to the Swedish government. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then we're going to our next panels. Very quickly, um, Ms. Yamato. Yes, my name is Naoko Yamamoto. Nice to, uh, uh, very happy to join. And I'm Assistant Director General of WHO in the Healthier UHC and the Healthier Corporation, which works with nutrition, the food system, and the health for all. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very, very much. And, um, I think we can get into it now just a bit. Brilliant. Now, um, we wanted to start the conversation in looking at the added value of the coalition. And Professor Hawks, I'll ask you to speak to that. What is the value of the coalition at this point? Um, and how can the coalition harness the momentum that they've been working on to deliver impactful change for people and planet? Thanks uh, for that question, Pierre. So the, the real focus of this coalition is making effective action happen at the country level. And the way that we want to do that is to make sure that healthy diets and sustainable food systems, to keep that on the agenda and bring capacity to accelerate action at the country level. But importantly, not just in government, but across different sectors and help governments work across sectors and stakeholders. A second uh, related aspect is to build capacity for a food systems approach, which is what we've been missing so far to help countries identify what's gonna work best in their context to achieve their goals and align this action and enable peer-to-peer -peer learning on this approach as well. And last but not least, we will play a role coordinating all the different forms of global level action to optimize the contribution between all the different stakeholders, whether it's a UN agency or a global NGO, private sector, to really make sure that we're optimizing and making efficient the type of support and capacity building that is available to accelerate this action at the country level. That's all, thank you. That's brilliant, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you. Uh, and, and I do think that that type of work, you know, a coalition bringing together synergies and ideas um, is always useful and beneficial for works like this, um, especially bringing together, you know, non-governmental organizations, um, governmental bodies and personnel to push for increased planetary health. Um, I do think that small island developing states would benefit from this type of coalition. And um, we should probably look at how we can get more islands like myself and from Barbados um, to get involved in this type of um, conversation um, and to help to support the work of the coalition. 
Now, um, in continu continuing the discussion and, and looking at the work around the world, I'm going to turn to Her Excellency Dr. Leah Tedesse, uh, the Minister of Health for Ethiopia, um, to take the floor and just share with us your thoughts about why Ethiopia joined this coalition and what you expect to come out of this work. Um, and we would also love to hear some of the commitments and action that Ethiopia has taken to deliver healthy diets for, from sustainable food systems for all. And it's really important to hear your perspective, especially with the progressive work that you all have been doing. Um, it's really interesting to hear from you now. Thank you so much. Uh... So when we see the policy and program environment uh, for Ethiopia around nutrition, it's, uh, we do have a rich policy and program environment, but there are many challenges, particularly around access to nutrient healthy and nutrient dense food. Our production is not diverse enough and where available, these nutrient dense foods are not affordable for many. So uh, we see strengthening linkages of our nutrition programs to food system transformation is really key. And we have taken, we have committed to taking a healthy nutrient dense diet centered approach to the food system transformation pathway. And through the process we have uh, gone through, we have developed six clusters of game changing solutions in this uh, pathway. And uh, what we envision is to leverage on our existing policy and program environment to accelerate progress uh, by taking advantage of existing efforts and resources, but again, introducing the new uh, uh, pathways. So we see this as an opportunity where uh, all food system actors can contribute to the attainment of healthy diets from uh, different angles of how they operate. As the coalition was being developed, members of our technical steering committee participated in the process and we were constantly uh, informed and contributed to the evolution of the coalition for which we feel very grateful. We now have an Ethiopian food system transformation pathway that we are really committed to implement and uh, create an environment where the diverse food system actors that seek to contribute can find entry points. We believe the objectives of the coalition within our context can help us align the existing efforts with the efforts of multiple stakeholders uh, uh, that, seeks to, that seek to contribute. And also it is, it's, the process is helping us identify entry points for new actions so that we can get energy of actions and minimize trade-offs. And we believe the coalition can also help align efforts of uh, other coalitions that we want to work with, such as the school, feed, the school feeding coalitions and others that we also are taking up as programs as a country, as well as uh, programs like uh, the Sakota Declaration or commitment that our country has uh, pledged uh, to end stunting uh, by uh, under under two years by 2030. So we see the different linkages that would be possible uh, through this coalition. Thank you so much. Thank you um, very much, Dr. Tedesse. And I, and I think what your intervention has shown um, is that the the benefit of working together um, to push these objectives can benefit all. And, and I want to ask about some of the policies that you mentioned. Um, and particularly, I know you've done great work around uh, the banning of marketing of breast milk substitutes. Um, how can we translate those experiences um, as a part of the coalition to other states, for example, small island developing states? How can we transfer um, the work that you've done in your experience to benefit other states who want to put similar policies in place? Yes, when, uh, when we look at uh, uh, food transformation, and particularly uh, uh, healthy and sustainable diets. It's uh, the combination of uh, many interventions by different uh, sectors and actors. And uh, we need to make sure those synergize uh, each other. And as you mentioned, for example, the uh, uh, breastfeeding, ensuring that we have an environment that really promotes breastfeeding, which is um, the, uh, I mean, uh, an entire food system for a child for less than six months is really key. So we have a new proclamation on baby food control uh, uh, directive, which was released just uh, earlier this year, I mean, uh, in October this year to address marketing of breast milk substitutes. So uh, this we do have, of course, we have to see the implementation to say anything, but uh, we believe this uh, uh, will, will really help in, in the way forward. But 
also the combination, as I mentioned, of uh, different policies and uh, programs that we have for uh, 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 in the agriculture to, to help financing, for example, of agriculture is really key, which we have uh, highlighted as a key area to focus on to ensure that we have to address the availability, the production aspect of it. So uh, there is a really key uh, to, to work on the linkage of the different sectors, the actors uh, of diverse, uh, in diverse groups, including private sector and academia and research to really uh, push in those, uh, uh, those agenda. Thank you. And again, what, what you've been highlighting for us and what I, I hope comes across to your audience is that um, th there's no single way to fix the issues. There, there's no single way to ensure food security and food sustainability. Um, we need a basket of policies, multiple policies and, and synergies across different states and different organizations in order to get the job done. And again, it's that type of commitment that we hope to have seen at COP26. Um, and that's the type of commitment we need in the health um, space, you know, working together to get the job done and using different policies to get the job done. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Tedeshi. Um, and I, I think it's, it's good now to move over to understand um, just looking at the situation or looking at the developments in Sweden, for example. Um, I think it's important for us to hear that perspective um, about the food system and the pathways of dealing with the you know, innovative nutrition actions um, that you've implemented. Um, so Mr. Nordstrom, I think now is the point where I'd like to have you come in and talk about what have those policies uh, look like and what are some of the details around, you know, creating those innovative actions. No, thank you, Pierre. Um, just checking that you can hear me. I just switched the computer. Is it OK? Yes, I can hear you. Brilliant. OK, very good. That's easier for me. Uh, no, first, delighted to be here, as I said. Uh, just a couple of words about the coalition first. And sometimes we talk about uh, food for thought. Uh, we must make sure that this is now food for change. Because a little bit as we see it from the Swedish side, food is really one of the major entry points for changing and improving people's health and the plan planet's health, both on the climate agenda and on the health agenda. So food is for change, not just for thoughts. Uh, second is that I see the coalition as really moving both from the food summit, but also from Glasgow, from commitments to action that the coalition, coalition can really be a platform where we can join hands and do it. Uh, and the third one is a given, of course, that the coalition should also be a way of taking much more of a systems approach. I have my background in the health sector since 30 years, but now with dealing with food is not just about one sector, it's about taking a systems approach. I just wanted to say those words initially, because I really believe that a coalition could be very important. In terms of Sweden, um, I'm very happy, and I, hopefully we will have this also in English, but an outcome of the food summit uh, was actually that we have developed a roadmap for sustainable food systems in Sweden. Because this is important for Sweden. It's not just important for Ethiopia or for Japan or for the UK or for Sierra Leone that I was working in once. Um, something that is really an issue for Sweden. And it's also mainly affecting then people having that are less well off, that are more vulnerable, the lowest socioeconomic groups. This is an issue of poverty in Sweden even if we are one of the richest countries in the world. So food matters for our people and for people's health. Some of the things that we have already done, as you were saying, that some of the policies we have in place, yes, we have labeling of uh, food products so that people can see whether those products are both healthy and green. Uh, and we are trying to develop this now also using modern IT technology so people easily can see what they are actually buying both where it's coming from and whether it's good for your health and good for the climate. Um, as part of this, we have also now um, giving a special assignment to our, our agency for food and for our agency for public health to develop specific national indicators for ensuring that we move towards a sustainable food system in Sweden. So we would like to make to have accountability with checks and balances in terms of the indicators. We have also engaged in, in a dialogue with the private food industry in terms of the levels of sugar and salt in, in food. Uh, we haven't regulated it yet uh, in the same way as other countries. So we are trying on the voluntary basis, but we're also very keen to learn from other countries. And finally, I should say, we're not just doing this at home. So for us to enjoy, uh, engage with now co, uh, 
uh, and WHO on the agenda that we call healthy populations to see what can we do to empower people to make more healthy choices, what we call healthier societies, enabling and empowering, enabling people to make more healthy choices for themselves. That's a critical element of our international development engagement, not aid, but in terms of global health. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll get back to a bit of that conversation a bit later, and especially that point of nutrition labeling. I know that's a fight that we're trying to get done in the Caribbean, and, and it would be interesting to share those experiences. Um, we're going to move on to Dr. Yamamoto. Um, and I think, again, um, we want to hear from you, um, especially around your work in campaigning for food systems for health throughout the summit. What is uh, WHO currently doing with regard to ensuring healthy and, and sustainable diets for all? And will it step up to help realize this vision? Thank you, Pierre. And uh, thank you very much for uh, asking that question. First of all, let me say that this year is a seminar year for the nutrition at the end of uh, at the middle point of the decade of action, action on nutrition, but also UN Food System Summit and the COP26 has already done. And now the next is a upcoming Nutrition for Growth Summit in December. So these are key opportunities for WHO to derive progress on our core mandate to promote health and well-being for all. So uh, in brief, our work on the transforming food system for the health for people and planet cover three areas. First, governance. Second, policy action and data and monitoring. With this governance for nutrition, WHO has been promoting multi-sectoral action and health in all policy within food system and coordinate effort to deliver health, health diet for all. And Ethiopia has been and a couple of uh, previous speakers have already mentioned. Within the policy action, WHO is providing a normative guidance to help define healthy diet and indicators to roll out the strategy to reduce sodium intake, eliminate trans fat acid, and support one health approach. And we have been developing and promoting our menu of the priority food system action, including regulation of the restrict marketing of the food and the beverages to children, taxation of sugar sweetened beverages, front of the park laboring, and public food procurement, as well as other actions to, to, to do it. And we can, as Pierre, you said that we can discuss these issues later, I think. And the third is data and monitoring. So WHO is driving action and accountability. So for example, global database on the implementation of nutrition action or global nutrition policy report provide essential information to decision-making, identify gaps, and we will have some exciting development in nutrition indicators planning uh, the next year. So these three areas is, I think, the, uh, as WHO, the pushing to the address these issues. And this is also cross, uh, perfectly complement the vision and approach of the Healthy Diet Coalition, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And many of those policies you mentioned, I know, are dear to the heart of um, the panelists and members today, and, and even to the work of organizations in, in small island developing states. Um, I know particularly of the Healthy Caribbean Coalition and their work around sugar sweetened beverages and the taxation thereof. Um, it's really critical to developing the objectives we are looking at. Um, and I'll just continue to a bit of the trickier questions now that we've gotten to know you a bit. Um, and I'll start with Professor Hawks. Now, the, the, one of the essential elements of the coalition is talking about sustainable food systems. And in less than one year, world leaders will meet in Egypt for COP27, where countries will need to announce radical changes to their nationally determined contributions to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Now, what role do you foresee the coalition taking in advocating for and supporting in action of this, especially with what some may term the disappointing outcomes of COP26. What can the coalition do to, to support better action? That's a great question. And, and let me pick up first uh, by way of answering that on the points that Anders have made, as well as the Honourable Minister, uh, about this kind of systems approach. Uh, because fundamentally, the answer is by taking a systems approach, which basically means setting a very clear 
goal about what we want to achieve on the diet side and the sustainability side. And then that involves shifting the entire system towards that goal and asking the question, where were the entry points throughout food systems where change is needed to affect these goals? And then identifying, as the Honourable Minister emphasised, who has the power to make those changes across sectors, across government departments and across different sectors, the whole range of people, and then coordinating and aligning their action. And then identifying how those actions that need to be taken influence other food systems goals. And this is where this point comes in around, around co-benefits and trade-offs. So as part of that, we say, well, we want to achieve this goal, such as improving the diversity of people's diets or reducing ultra processed foods intake. How do we take that action, which also aligns with uh, climate goals and then putting together a portfolio of action? So what I'd like to see and what we what the coalition sorry, uh, the role that the coalition will play will be saying, where are these co-benefits? Where is the alignment between actions on healthy diets and actions on sustainability and how do we manage some of those kind of trade-offs and, and bringing to the fore some of the evidence that's really beginning to emerge in this area and building capacity in countries so that the different actors that are concerned with sustainability and healthy diets are talking to each other, aligning, coordinating and also coordinating that at the, at the global level, the United Nations Environment Programme is part of the Healthy Diets Coalition and uh, as well as World Health Organization, as we've just heard and others, and making sure that we're coordinating our messaging about how to align actions between healthy diets and sustainability at the global level as well. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, thank you for that reflection. And again, it, it, we, we're getting coming out here a systems approach uh, and more of a synergy. And Dr. Tedesse, I just wanna ask you again, um, in looking at that systems and synergy, how do you see the coalition, for example, assisting um, with your first food-based dietary guidelines? How do you see the coalition assisting with tackling malnutrition in Ethiopia? Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, as Ethiopia, we do face uh, multiple burdens of malnutrition and particularly diet quality as reflected by the law. So the first objective of this food-based dietary guideline is to provide dietary recommendations for Ethiopians two years and older for the, to improve their quality, including diversity and food sa safety for optimal health. But also, as uh, I said earlier, the limited availability and accessibility of nutrient-dense food basket to most households is a challenge. So uh, the second objective that this guideline seeks to address is by promoting broad uh, food system action, supporting diet quality, being sensitive to sustainability. So uh, these objectives are what inform the healthy diet centered approach to the uh, pathway uh, in response to the process we are taking through food system pathway and uh, what we expect uh, to get from the coalition by the implementation of this uh, uh, food, food um, the guideline is uh, uh, at least we see three perspectives that we need to work on. Uh, one is of course uh, that there is uh, something for everyone to do from the production to consumption of food along the value the food value chain so we know that this is a call for uh, uh, very aligned to the objectives of the healthy diets coalition but particularly on the uh, next steps for our uh, guideline we need for example to contextualize to different subnational settings because even this this is a national guideline we are a, a big country with diverse uh, uh, cultures which really impacts the foods and the diets so uh, we plan to contextualize it into the different subnational settings, including pastoral settings. And we also would like to see how different food system actors can align um, uh, their efforts guided by this guideline to contribute to attainment of uh, better diets uh, through their unique uh, entry points as uh, called for already. And we want to see also uh, implementing continued evidence generation. Uh, that we can use to revise guidelines and adapt as our food systems evolve, because this is a continuously evolving process and needs more evidence. So we believe the coalition can really help in generating uh, such evidence uh, to help in, uh, in the implementation going forward. So, uh, and of course, resource mobilization is of course a critical issue. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that. Um, and one of the things that, that 
it's, it's concerning um, to many organizations and, and even governments and persons um, is somewhat of the, the membership and engagement and how we can get persons to work together, um, but also to ensure there's no conflict of interest. Um, and principles of engagement uh, tend to help with that support. Um, now, I, I want to pose a quick question to Dr. Yamamoto in terms of principles of engagement. How will the WHO, as a member of the coalition, support the development of principles of engagement to help manage conflicts of interest? Thank you, Pierre. It's very important, but very difficult question, honestly. Thank you very much for asking that one. As we are in the formative stage, uh, formative stage of the coalition, this has been key focus while developing coalition's work plan and the governance structure. So the WHO is currently working closely with UNICEF and members of the coalition to develop the principle of the engagement. So, uh, but we look at the connect to WHO guideline with the prevention and the management of the conflict to interest as you said that in the policy development and implementation of the nutrition program at the country level. So policy development and implementation at the country level, we need to think about both. And this is firmly echo to the international code of the breast milk, um, marketing the breast milk substitutes, and also WHO set up the recommendation on the marketing of the foods and beverages into children. So those, these principles of the engagement, we look safeguard normative guidance and the governance element against conflict of interest to ensure the confidence in the coalition. So we need to identify the role of the different actors. So we definitely, we need a partners, huge engagement, broader engagement. But uh, the, when we talk about the private sector, as a private sector has a critical role as implementer, but we should not create a spaces that allow them to influence the normative work to advise the government. So how to make good balance, we are still working for it, but thank you very much for asking the, the question. Different thank trees, you. we need a broader partnership. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that perspective. And again, just to, to reiterate the importance of the work of the coalition, um, uh, the work you're doing is brilliant, especially around this conversation and conflicts of interest. Um, in the Caribbean, for example, it's a serious conversation that we're having about um, ministries of health, for example, taking funding from, you know, um, big food corporations or big tobacco co corporations to fund projects and to fund um, uh, uh, campaigns. Um, it's a concern, you know, it's a concern. And recently we had significant show of um, commitment in Jamaica where the Minister of Health banned uh, all health organizations from receiving donations from these type of companies. Um, so th those principles of engagement will definitely help us to navigate how we deal with conflict of interest whilst we work on a systems approach. Um, and I think at this point, uh, Nor uh, Mr. Nordstrom, just looking at mixing country and global level experiences, um, I would like to ask you, as someone who has worked with this topic uh, of, of health and food systems for many years, how do you see the coalition fitting into the global landscape? How do you see them translating to that global space as a global actor? No, thank you. Um, I mean, as the food is about both food production and food consumption. And as you said, also, this has to do both with the private and the public sector. We can't have the public sector, the government to produce the food. We need the private sector to do that, but we need the public sector to set the rules of the game. Uh, so, so there's three re reflections on this. First is that um, we, of course, need the right kind of policies. All of those issues are political. Uh, and what I can see happening sort of more and more is that we're getting stronger and stronger regional sort of decision making and political gatherings. The African Union now during the pandemic has came out very strongly. You have got the CARICOM, you've got the European Union, et cetera, et cetera. So those regional platforms where um, there are strong political uh, ownership and decision making, I, I think will be groups that the coalition should um, work more proactively with because we need the right kind of policy decisions. Second is, of course, that where the, the our coalition fits in at the sort of in between the national and the global, that's just in terms of sharing experiences, what works. From the production to the consumptions, when it comes to how do you engage with the consumers, uh, how do you empower people to make more healthy choices when it comes to food, knowledge share, sharing, what works. Taxation, behavior change, um, 
incentives, how do you work with the private sector? I mean, there's a number of issues in the, on this agenda and just sharing the experiences. But the last one, and that has slight, partly to do with data and the co-benefits that Corina was speaking about, it's not just that, but we have different language in the different sectors. Uh, so I think what the coalition really can help with is that when we speak about the co-benefits, when we speak about it from what are really the impact uh, from a climate perspective, we use climate language. When we speak about it from a health perspective, we use health language, but they are not speaking to each other. I'm simplifying it a bit, but we have different communities that have different perspectives here. Very strong, but if the coalition also can bring them together when it comes to understanding what are really our goals, what is it that we would like to achieve, and then understanding that those co-benefits are really, those co-interests are really there. So I think what the coalition can do is also then to bring, I mean, we talk about systems, but doing that in practice for me, it's, it's quite a lot about language and, and cultures here in between different communities, agriculture, nutrition, food, et cetera, et cetera. Those are different cultures that the coalition can help overcoming and bring together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, and one of the points um, in terms of bringing that language together, just to make the point a bit clearer, for example, my engagement with uh, the youth organizations and health organizations in the Caribbean is to translate those technical health messages into a way that youth can understand and appreciate so that they too can be passionate about the action. Um, and I think sometimes persons don't see the connect between the built environment and the health environment. And it's important to use the language in both spheres to explain how they are interconnected. Um, so it's really, really important that point you made about using the language within each group to connect them and to connect our synergies and to connect our missions. Um, thank you, thank you for those reflections. And I wanna go into a quick fire question for, for all of you, <laughs> and I'm a little excited about this one. Um, it, for just one minute, I'll give you a chance um, to, to, to tell me, 2021 has been the year of commitment um, to nourishing actions. Um, and I want to know what is the number one outcome that you hope to see at the country level and at the global level in 2022? What do you hope to see in that year um, at your country level and then the level of global commitment? We'll start for, first with Professor Hawks. Thank you. Well, uh, it's quite straightforward, really. I'd like to see at the country level that all countries have prioritised healthy diets from sustainable food systems. Often it gets dropped to the bottom of agendas. We want to see all countries prioritising it. And at the global level, uh, I want to see the Healthy Diets Coalition alive and well and uh, doing what it's supposed to do and accelerating change at the country level that helps uh, people live healthier lives and helps our planet at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Tedesse, what, what are the outcomes that you're looking forward to? Well, food system has many layers, as we know, and at a country level, uh, I think it's important for all to commit to bring harmony to the efforts of uh, different sectors and stakeholders so that we can uh, really attain a collective and positive momentum. And by the different sectors, I mean the government sectors, development partners, UN agencies, the CSO, private sector and academia all go to really uh, align our efforts. And the second from the global level, what we hope to see is uh, the commitment to nourishing actions that uh, complements our efforts, not only for us as a country, but the African continent as a whole. And uh, we all know that uh, as a continent, we uh, suffer from uh, many challenges in the food system and climate change, and uh, we don't have time to waste. So. I think the global uh, committee must recognize efforts both at country level, but also at the regional level, uh, aligning with efforts as African Union instruments as well, so that we go in the same direction for a greater impact and allocate the needed resources. Thank you. And I'm really happy to hear that point about the connection between climate change and health. Hopefully we can have another discussion sometime about those um, connections and why it's important that we work together in those spheres. Um, Dr. Yamamoto, what, what are you looking for at, you know, the country level or countries level, and then at the global level um, in terms of, you know, seeing increased action for healthy food systems? Thank you very much. And very quickly, uh, at country level, uh, measurable increase in the number of the country sign up the coalition and implement 
the policy action from our menu of action. The global level keeps the political momentum about the uh, coalition and it continue to the per strong partnership of, with the civil society, research partners and other member states. But, and I would like to add it at the local level, as the minister clearly said, that we need local level empowerment to, uh, uh, to, to take action. Uh, this is uh, Anders also mentioned about this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and just before I go on to uh, Anders to give us his um, outcomes that he's expecting, I want to invite persons to share your questions um, in the question box. We are going to pose them to our panelists in just a few. Um, and just before that, Anders, I want to hear from you. What are you looking forward to at the country level? And I know you've done brilliant work and, and Sweden has been doing brilliant work, but what more are you looking forward to at the country level? And then at the global level, in terms of commitments to food sustainability and better food systems? I mean, very tangible and practically, if I look at Sweden for the next year, I hope we will have a framework, an accountability framework with clear indicators in place, approved. So we know what are our goals, where are we, what are we working towards, and that we can measure whether we are making progress or not. Uh, to have that really in place, I think that would be great. Uh, and in some ways, similar things at the global level. What I really would like to see is we were speaking about the COP and the next COP. At this COP, there were 70 side events talking about health. In the outcome document, health was mentioned once, one word. Next time, so that one or more can be more articulated, what is it and why is it that we would like to see when it comes to the health impacts of climate and preferably then via the food agenda? We are clear about the climate goal in terms of the two degrees, the reducing um, our uh, admission of greenhouse gases, etc. On the health side, how do we measure what we would like to see happening? When we work on food, we talked about the lack of food, access to food, food safety, but what is really the health impact? How do we measure that? What is our two degree goal? That I would like to see in the next COP agreement that by addressing food, we can both contribute a third of the climate impact, but also a third of what we are having in terms of risk factors for people living not long and healthy lives, but the opposite. So if we can have a more clear goal in terms of what is really the health outcome, that is something I would like to see from this coalition. Sorry, thank, thank you very much for that perspective. And I think my first question to you um, that we received, and, and this is for all of you, um, what global policies or strategies um, or global support is lacking, if any, in order to support people at the country level? Um, what is needed to ensure that we don't just sit and talk about it, but that we can move to actually implement some of these suggestions and policies? Um, uh, Professor Hawks, we're gonna start with you on this question. Sure. Yeah, I think um, it's a it's a it's a really pertinent question because when action needs to happen at the country level, then what what is the role of a of a of a global entity? But I would I would really like to emphasize the importance of uh, building capacity and alignment uh, uh, in order to take this systems approach at the country level because it's not just about acting for action's sake; it's about acting in a way that will actually make a difference to real people's lives uh, and the planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 building capacity uh, to help countries do that, and bringing together the the capacity in country already to to work across sectors and stakeholders to do that will be vital. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedesco. The same question: What is needed to ensure that we don't just talk about this, but we can see action? Well, uh, the primary thing is, of course, a political commitment, making it a global agenda is a very strong, uh, gives it a strong power to make it a political agenda for countries, for leaders, so that they take the, uh, it as a commitment, uh, but it needs also to be supported with resources. So I think aligning the uh, resources with the agenda is critical, but uh, it all boils down to leadership. So strong political commitment and leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yamamoto. Thank you very much. In addition to the previous speakers has already said about the first co coordination and the cooperation with the partners at the country level, not only mm -hmm. the UN agency, but bilateral agency, many yeah. civil society group. Second issues is 
uh, bring the voice of the people at the global level, country level, uh, national level, and also local level. Uh, especially the uh, small silent voice from the um, marginalized people or disadvantaged people in health equity. Finally, we need more research and data about how to measure our progress, how to measure the, our, uh, then also create a good indicator to measure it, evaluate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a really good point around research. Sometimes the research is lacking to support our actions. Um, and, and Anders, just uh, the same question. What, what do you think is needed to ensure that we don't just talk about these issues, but we can actually implement them? I think by, by just looking at what is happening, because I mean, most of this will not, as we said, happen at the global level, of course. But if you're going to take a systems approach, looking at c communities, community approaches where you can work across sectors and taking more of a systems approach, that is happening in quite a few places. Let's visualize that and make that known. And the same thing at the city level. I think a lot of the more, what I call, um, healthier societies for healthy populations, it's difficult to do at the national level, at the global level. But if you look at more at the local level, city level or community level, it's much easier. So I think instead of thinking what we can do at the global level, just making it visible what is already happening and sharing that and then drawing some lessons and then providing some inputs to that in terms of how I can make that even more effective. But I, I think just starting by looking around. Thank you. Um, and, and Professor Hawks, we have a, a very important and I think critical question for you. Um, looking at the insight and, and you share some insight into the cross-sector coordination to achieve both goals of improving diets and creating sustainable food systems. And uh, I'm wondering uh, if the coordination with human rights bodies is included in this endeavor of you know, cross-sector collaboration. Can the rights to health, food, and a healthy environment be used as a concrete way of implementing change? Basically, can a rights-based approach be critical or helpful to implementing the change we want to see? The rights-based approach is, is really important and there's many very passionate and engaged stakeholders um, who um, are driving this approach forward. And what's critical is to say, if we are to uh, implement a rights-based approach, what does it actually mean in practice? It's not just about speaking rhetoric about people having the right to food or the right to health. It's about saying, what does that actually look like in terms of action and intervention and policy and so on? What, will, what is actually needed uh, in this uh, approach to, to make that happen. And otherwise it just becomes rhetoric uh, and just becomes uh, fighting for something which is a, ends up as being a hollow, hollow idea. So I think it's important because it actually says, we'll only get to the right to food and the right to health if we actually do something to realize that. Um, and uh, that is, is, is motivating and leads to a focus on very specific actions that have to be identified. Thank you, thank you very much. And that rights-based approach is something that's uh, near and dear to my heart. I think our governments have a specific role um, in terms of ensuring that the commitments at the international level are implemented at the local level in terms of the rights of children to health, the rights of children and people to a healthy and sustainable food environment. And there are many documents that governments have signed on to committing to ensuring the right to health. And I think that you know we need that political will and commitment to ensuring these things are done. Um, I'm not sure we have time for another question. I'll try to sneak one more in. <laughs> um, so I wanna ask this question again around that space of you know, um, protection of children, protection of their rights. Um, is anything already happening on the topic of project and practical, you know, um, especially looking at actions within the school system or the school environment? Um, have any practical actions been taken based on, you know, child psychology, which looks at activities that can help them to increase their healthy behaviors or take more healthier actions? Um, just in a way that can be fun for them. Dr. Tedesse, maybe you can help us. Is there any way that you found or, or your, your uh, ministry has worked on to make sure that children understand how to protect their health and you know, understand their rights to um, health? Thank you, it's uh, really a critical point. We, it's really not early stage, but one key initiative is the early childhood development. 
uh, where we are uh, looking into the holistic development of children in addition to nutrition, ensuring uh, uh, that, for example, play is integrated into their um, uh, schooling from the uh, lowest uh, level so that they get, they get the nurturing uh, environment uh, to help them understand. So, so not only giving them the right nutrition, but also uh, teaching them how to uh, uh, know to be healthy and understand to be healthy. So, but it requires a holistic environment of nurturing environment. And we have started implementing like a pilot, in, a pilot initiative in uh, the capital in Addis, which we hope to scale in a, com a comprehensive early childhood development initiative for uh, those in schools, in health and uh, in social services and daycares uh, to look into this. The other is of course the integration of uh, uh, health education within the school curriculum, especially starting from the primary uh, school, uh, which is also a joint effort. We are working with the Ministry of Education. So the integration uh, of key uh, principles of nutrition within the curriculum, but and also integrating it with school feeding programs. So now we are expanding school feeding programs this is critical to make uh, food available for our students, but not only uh, availability, but at the same time, making sure what we provide is also teaching them in terms of uh, their uh, diet habits. Uh, so these are a few of the things that it yeah. requires a lot of efforts. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more with your sentiments. And I think all those points about making sure that the information is digestible is key for children. Um, and Anders pointed it out earlier, using the correct language to connect to the right audience is key to making sure our connections and messages get out there in a brilliant way. Um, and, and currently, I know that uh, there's some work being done in the Caribbean on protecting our children and a campaign to protect children. And it's around those messages of, you know, banning marketing in schools of unhealthy foods. Um, the messages of making sure unhealthy foods aren't available in the schools and basically ensuring that children, that vulnerable group are protected. That is our responsibility. You know, it's at the global level, the WHO level, at the national level, it is our responsibility to protect that vulnerable group. Um, and I think I'll take one more question for Professor Hawks. And it, I think it's a brilliant question. Um, we welcome the formation of this coalition and, and we're happy to have this um, coalition on board. Now, could you tell us who can become a member and, and will the coalition play a role in documenting existing and emerging good practices um, to facilitate practical learning for policymakers and advocates? So basically, how will the coalition help to synergize um, and document information from different groups, you know, in the Caribbean, in, in Africa, um, in Sweden, how will the coalition help to coordinate that information so anyone can access it and implement these policies? And also importantly, who can become a member of the coalition? So on who can, can become a member, we're working this through at this point in time, but the principle is that it would be very broad. Um, and if we're gonna have a, a major coordination role, which is the plan, then it means coordinating the groups who have a stake in this, which means being broad. So uh, we're, we're, we're still working this through and, and, and planning, we're in that planning phase. And we have started by engaging with what we're calling some front runner countries of which uh, Ethiopia and others, um, our, um, our ones, uh, Sweden and so on. So we're starting with that, but we will broaden out and we will, we will plan that moving forward and communicate that in due course. In terms of documenting um, good practices, the idea is to enable practical learning by providing a space for peer-to-peer -peer learning. And there are quite a lot of networks out there already. And we feel that um, to, to learn from those and the lessons from those, to build capacity by enabling peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, including South to South and triangular kind of cooperation um, in order to enable those practical learnings, um, rather than just saying, okay, we just get the academic evidence and, and, and bring that forward, which we can do too, uh, but really to enable countries to learn from each other and the different stakeholders in those countries to learn from each other as well. Brilliant, brilliant. And I, I do think I wanna take this point, especially to say to our members on the call, um, just to check out the coalition and look at the brilliant work that has been done um, and the potential. I, I mean, just from hearing today, there's great potential for coordinated action. Um, I think one of the key partners that, that uh, could be a brilliant um, tool or support to the coalition is looking at small island developing states. Um, Anders mentioned the CARICOM region. Um, there's brilliant resources there about how we can ensure that across the globe from, you know, the 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 larger countries to the smaller countries, all are coordinated in this effort to scaling up 
nutrition. Um, thank you so much. You guys have been a brilliant, brilliant set of panelists today and provided great feedback. Um, and I would like to hand over to uh, Gerda Verberg, the coordinator of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, to just provide some closing remarks for today's session. Um, thank you so much, guys, for your um, interventions today. Gerda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Pierre. Um, and thank you for brilliant moderating and the beautiful bridge to Scaling Up Nutrition uh, Movement. First of all, I loved this um, um, event because it was interactive from the very first uh, moment and that is how these kind of events should be with critical questions and um, and not uh, not avoiding the hot stuff. Um, furthermore, I think this is food for change. Think in system, but also um, uh, be aware of the fact that, for instance, the Caribbean Barbados need different solutions than Ethiopia requests. And even within the country, you have different need to respect different cultures and different uh, situations. So have a tailor-made uh, solutions. Then I would like to make 10 uh, uh, closing remarks on the how. First of all, I think at the country level, it is of crucial importance to uh, include, continue to include healthy diet and nutrition in the food systems dialogues that are still continuing building the food system pathways. And I think every uh, health and nutrition champion should be at the table to make sure that this is included and um, included. At the same time, invite there the climate people because you will not improve food systems and make them healthy without also dealing with the climate. So climate, uh, national determined uh, uh, contributions and uh, nutrition uh, commitments need to come together. And then capability development is of crucial importance. It's mentioned here, but let me emphasize this. Research, there is a lot of research. The point is, how do we ask the right research that we need in the country uh, situation? And again, Barbados different from Ethiopia or uh, Vietnam. Ask, be sharp in the demands, then the researches and knowledge can uh, deliver on demand. Um, there is multi-sectoral decision-making, as was emphasized at, um, in Ethiopia, but also embrace multi-stakeholder collaboration also at the country level. And for that reason, it is crucial to have a clear uh, policy of dealing, preventing and dealing with conflict of interest. And you need to have uh, principles of engagement to which each and everyone uh, agrees, because you cannot do without the different stakeholders working hand in hand to make it happen. Then the global coalition. My request to you as global coalition is stay open, stay open and connective because at the World Health Assembly, but also at uh, the FAO um, conferences, at the COP, at the UNEP, we need to deal with all the different issues together. So um, bring them to the table and consider them from the different perspectives and once more embrace systems and complexity. For COP27, and I heard Anders that he was, uh, he was disappointed, I was at COP26 and I'm not disappointed because food was and nutrition was simply not on the agenda. But for COP27, it is crucial that a global coalition players continue to do the strong advocacy to mark, make it part and parcel of the agenda, of the negotiations and of the outcomes of COP27 and the COPs that are going beyond. Then um, I would like to embrace the fact of document, document, showcase where are the successes, where are the pitfalls and inspire each other. So documentation is also crucial uh, here. And then make um, uh, food, health and climate issues part and parcel of elections. I have been a politician. I'm amazed to see how, um, how almost never food, health, and climate is really a part of the, of the election campaigns and then hold your politicians to account. Finally, final two remarks, funding. Uh, global funding will continue to be important, but I think first, and that's a lesson from the Sun Movement as well, first make sure that the, that the government of a country is investing and put its money where its mouth is. And then international banks, investors, funds, uh, donors, 
please align behind the government and push the national agenda. And finally, um, if you agree with me that for this event, we had a very, very best moderator, um, join me in applauding uh, Pierre and thank him and all participants uh, for this brilliant, brilliant event. And with this, I think the meeting is closed. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye bye. Very well done, all of you. Thank bye bye. Bye bye.